Testing video switch. Good, no video switch. <clears throat> and I have audio too. <laughs> I do. Testing one, two. That's good. I just turned on mine. Well, I'm also close. Yes, you're, you're a little bit closer. Yeah. I think we have a solution. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. What did you find out? This is the questioning chair. Yeah, it's on the computer. This is my headset microphone. Yes, which I know works. Which is the right. That the mic is just a prop. This is This is the mic. There is a con issue with the connection. Um, this computer is smart enough now to know when it's connected. I just have not figured out about the uh, somewhere around 256 combination, which one's right. And that just takes time. And page, which I don't have. I don't have, I have a lot of time. Do you still have a job? No. No? No. I've been looking for a little over a month. Yeah, I'm, I'm, but I did a contract for a certain time. Hopefully this next week. All right, so we're going to send out the email now, and by we I mean him. And uh, hopefully uh, we'll get this show on the road shortly. Is this open It's reserved for you. I don't care. He doesn't want to sit near any. Okay, I think we're. Okay. <laughs> Is this the heckling section back here? Can we get James' uh, GitHub address on the board? Yeah, it'll probably be in the meeting notes if, uh, if you want to wait that long. Uh, All right, be that way. I'll get it. Mark! <laughs> Here, take this. All right. I had all sorts of links open, URLs open in my 16 open tabs of my browser on my laptop, which uh, many of you heard uh, died this morning. So <laughs> I think there were two links in the meeting uh, schedule. 
So uh, those are left as an exercise for the student. You can peruse those offline and, uh, and look at some things that are new and exciting, uh, or at least of interest. Uh, we've got some uh, exciting. OK, so the email has been sent. The uh, webcast is uh, active, and I'm blathering to a wider audience. So welcome to the afternoon session of the uh, March meeting of the Silicon Valley Fourth Interest Group. Uh, may, Sam wants to say something. May I interject something? I suppose if you must. So where I'm sitting, there is a microphone. You're free to talk into this microphone. It doesn't actually work. <laughs> <laughs> But you're free to talk into it because behind this microphone, there's another microphone that does work. And we have it configured through the computer, a separate computer, which I'm really hoping that our remote viewers can give us feedback on. Can you hear us? In fact, I'm going to stand behind over here. Can you hear me now? I'm going to say ABC. I'm going to walk over here and say one, two, three. So which did you hear better? ABC, one, two, three. Let me know, please, because this information is very important in order for us to get our Q&A uh, audio. And if any of you have questions, please approach the microphone and uh, speak, your, speak your questions. Thank you. All right. I... Uh I guess George, who said he had a really exciting big rumors and gossip uh, before the, the talk started thing to tell us, has now disappeared, <laughs> consistent with our usual, uh, our usual arrangements in that regard. So this reminds me of a story. We were walking to the bathroom passing this honking big uh, TV projector in the atrium. It's big, it's bright, it's a pretty impressive piece of gear. Is that all? Okay. This reminds me of the previous technology that this is uh, replacing. Uh, many years ago in the late 60s and 70s, they sold this thing called the Ida 4 Theater Video Projector. and. Uh, it had a, uh, a vacuum tube in which uh, there was an x-ray gun. It sprayed x-rays on this uh, oil-coated uh, disc that was constantly turning. And the x-rays would write on the oil, and you'd point a bright light at it, and the oil would ref the system would reflect or not reflect and put TV images up on a big, big screen. The, the bulb that lit this thing was a you know, aircraft landing light size xenon tube. The power supply for this thing was, was separate, about the size of a, of a fairly large end table. It looked a little like the ground starter in miniature for a, a small aircraft. Uh, but I guess I'm dating myself from a time when, when airports had ground starters for some of their passenger planes. Uh, so I said that there was a big vacuum tube where this x-ray stuff happened, this electron beam that rode on the uh, oil to make it uh, reflect or not reflect the, the picture. And uh, because you had to change out the, uh, the pieces, some of the pieces of this electron gun fairly frequently, this, uh, this tube was, in fact, a vacuum system. So you had, uh, hanging off the bottom of this thing, a... Uh, roughing pump and an oil diffusion pump to 
suck the air out of the vacuum tube. And uh, this power supply that ran the honking big light bulb, the honking big light bulb itself, some optics, big honking lens on the thing. And it was just a really impressive piece of gear. So I, uh, I expect uh, many of you that are interested in this exciting bit of news to just go out and Google it and hopefully find images and learn all about this. Uh, what has this got to do with anything? Nothing whatsoever. It's just filling time since, until George got back. <laughs> so, when you hear nitrous, flip it on otherwise you can't reach the And that's my job. Uh, my life. It says mute. Mute sounds pretty good to me right now. <laughs> it's on, I can hear. Oh, very well. Uh, when you hear nitrous and burn rubber, henceforth you will think of space X Victor. Solid fuel, nitrous is the oxidant and burn. Just want to make sure we're all on the same page. Uh, thank you for all coming. Many happy returns and on with the show. Ah, yes. Rocket fuel. An interesting topic. My favorite rocket fuel, unsymmetrical dimethyl hydrazine. It yes. just sounds cool. Ah, fuming red nitric acid. Oh, go, go, go. Those were the days. A few schedule notes for those of you who haven't learned. Uh, Windows XP is scheduled to stop. Right <laughs> to a screeching halt. Thank you. But, but seriously, uh, this is March meeting. It's everything is is remarkably normal. Uh, the April meeting will be on the third Saturday, just this once, because of a schedule conflict. It's all my fault. Yes, it's all Dave's fault that we can uh, enjoy these wonderful uh, surroundings. This venue uh, is very much appreciated and, uh, because stuff happens. Yes, that's why it says April and there's a 19 up here for those of you who are here. For those of you who are elsewhere, well, you'll figure it out. If you get on the uh, email list, uh, you'll hear all about this stuff. We'll send you once a month the announce email, all of that stuff. Uh, in May, there will be no May meeting as such. Uh, we were not able to get a table this year at Maker Fair, so uh, those of you who are interested in going to Maker Fair uh, will coordinate among yourselves and go en masse. On which day? That's for you to decide. I won't be there. Regrettably, I'll be out of town uh, that weekend. Uh, if I if I have a working laptop, that may actually be possible. Okay, and uh, coming up, I believe the first day of the expo is April first, but you'll have to go online to register in advance anyway, so you can look at the agenda and the schedule for what used to be called the Embedded Systems Show, and then it became sort of Design West or something like that, and now I think it's EE Live, although I think it's got at least two names now, uh, and they're still calling it the Embedded Systems Show on top of that, so uh, again, Coordinate amongst yourselves and, and go as a as a morass or a, a what's the collective noun for oh, never mind. Uh, so let's see. To review, EE Live starts April first. I think that's the first keynote. They throw out the first keynote speaker. Uh, nobody from Big Bang Theory this year. Darn. Uh, I won't be able to make it. Darn. Darn. Uh, so May, Maker Fair, uh, April, third Saturday. Uh, 
anybody got anything else? You know how they say. Okay. All right, what a pack of ne'er do wells you all are. Look at my question. All right. It looks like it's exactly. something I want to bother about. So you know we. Do. All right. That's why I can be brutally honest. You have a. We're going to take a, uh, a short intermission. The in while the uh, speaker uh, gets to the front of the room and gets mic'd up and you get a chance to go to the bathroom one last time and we'll uh, we'll start the first talk shortly. <laughs> yeah, take that and stick it on your belt. It's it's live. It's so if you go to the bathroom, watch what you talk about. Actually, it probably does reach. Probably does reach the bathroom. I recommend you turn off your screensaver if you can. Yeah, usually when you start a presentation, it won't turn off. Yeah, but if you get distracted. Yeah, I get frequently distracted. Or this morning speaker. You find that the screen saver You know, Windows boxes actually have a little click. You can click turn timers off on giving a presentation. Do they? I must be. <laughs> I like how people think that uh, after they pass up their XP will self explode and explode. You won't be able to use it at all. That's exactly right. Well, the internet will make sure that happens. <laughs> most of your APMs are still running. That's scary. No, it's not there. <laughs> yeah, I'm definitely not hearing anything. Definitely not hearing. I am hearing myself. Yeah, keep it on. Oh, I just did. Oh, okay. I'm not starting. Speakers who are such high quality caliber that they are all meant to keep no introduction. So the first thing you want to do is give my own introduction to how you are. Yes. Maybe say what you're talking about. There we go. Another 10 minutes. Just tell me when I want you want me to start.
yeah, you get used to these high resolution screens and then you have a projection system that's still from long ago and they go like 1040 or 1024, 768 or I don't think this is much more than that. satisfied. Mm. I think that this building isn't at all. So it's yeah. not a function of the hardware, it's just a function of how much money they Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, for the it doesn't it doesn't make much of a difference, but it's a problem if I want to show like a lab view diagram because they're all much bigger than that go we scale them. Uh -huh. yeah. <coughs> but <coughs> VGA. <laughs> I'll just leave it. I'll go with what I have. I like this presenter view because I can see notes, I can see the next slide coming up, and then that's just the present. Yeah. Um, I gave most of this to the LabVIEW user group in our office uh, about a month ago. It's a little bit different. Well, it's quite a different audience, so I don't know how <coughs> how well it will come across. Because the people in that group are all pretty much very experienced lab view people. But they're not compiler people. The compiler people are in Texas. In Texas. We're good to go. And we're still early. No. That's okay. <clears throat> Late eighties. So it's been around for a while. Yeah. Well, I 
Yeah. <coughs> I did one on salt for uh, who Lockheed Martin. Yeah. 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 Well, it has evolved a lot, so and it's it's used all over the world now. It's it's in uh, hundreds of thousands of people that use LabVIEW. And the company has grown too. We're now 1.2 billion. So probably last time I was talking to you guys, we probably were like 600 million. Taken to like because we see announcements of X company buying Y company. We've taken to pricing them in units of Instagrams <laughs> because Instagram yeah. purchased almost exactly one billion dollars, so it's a nice convenient metric unit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What were you asking? I, I forgot. You were asking something, or you're gonna. Yes, and it, that's a, it's an interesting point in that uh, as a company we've been very successful in getting uh, students in electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, chemical engineering to pick up the language and it's used all over in most of the big universities. It's used in, in the labs because people have to do measurements and uh, actual real world stuff. But the one area where we really have not been successful at all is in computer science. And it ain't going to happen because it's not Microsoft, it's not web stuff, and it's not just not going to happen. Um, we know that. It's, it's a battle. Um, and sometimes it's been very fr frustrating to some of our people that in the earlier years would go like to IEEE conferences on, on data flow languages. And they would have, the whole conference was on data flow languages. And there's all these professors from all over the world who would talk about all the esoteric stuff they had done, you know, from a computer science perspective. And then they would literally be aghast to hear that there was a data flow language that was used by, at that time, tens of thousands of engineers with real world examples, with real world stuff. They had never heard of it. But they all had their stuff that used enormous amount of resources and was slow as molasses, but had, you know, uh, yeah. It was but it was academically interesting, yes. <laughs> yeah, so that was uh, the background. And, yeah. yeah. But yeah, so, but in a lot of the labs, electronic labs, mechanical engineering, um, they use it uh, quite extensively. Because if you see what like mechanical engineers have to do now in some universities, like in one, uh, like in one semester, they have to design from scratch a Segway. Yeah. So they built the whole Segway like in a in a team, five to ten students or five students, and they build up a Segway, and that includes all the motors, the design, the mechanics, uh, the gearing, uh, the instrumentation, the gyroscopes and also the control theory behind it. How do you make it stable? And how do you design the control system? How do you um, hook it all up together? And they use LabVIEW extensively. So. I think we're about ready to start. 
Okay, my name is uh, Dirk de Mol. I work for National Instruments. Um, I'm the local field architect, which means that I help our sales force um, with customers that are building up large, complex, uh, LabVIEW-based uh, systems. Let me first ask, how many people at least have a passing knowledge of LabVIEW? Oh, okay, that makes it easy. So most people know uh, no lab use. So, yeah. Okay, that makes it easier. So you know that most of the uh, emphasis for us is scientific, academic, and um, industrial applications. With LabVIEW, you don't you don't write a word processor. You don't write an operating system. You don't write a game. Um, any computer science, if you want to work with data, very complex data structures, you want to design your own data structures, it's not the language. And it, it's very obvious when we get like a new employee on, and if he comes from a computer science background and you tell him, oh, you have to get into LabVIEW, and what are they going to do? They're going to try to do the bubble sort algorithm in LabVIEW, see how it works. If you have a mechanical engineer come online, is going to try to do a control algorithm to make something work. And if you have to do a bubble sort in LabVIEW, yeah, you can do it. But it's the wrong, the wrong environment. <laughs> There's a sorting algorithm in LabVIEW. Use it. You know, If you want to reinvent the wheel all the time, no. Um, that's not uh, what, it's, what it's for. But if you want to do a multi-core, multi-threaded, High performance application that does a lot of signal acquisition at very high rates and a massive amount of computations behind it. Uh, and you want to do you know all these FFTs and image processing and whatever, and you have to do it in real time. Yes, use Labio. That's kind of you know where its strengths are. If you have to then make a user interface on top of it, uh, even better. The user interfaces you built with LabVIEW are for, again, the scientific and industrial world. They're not for web-based type stuff. It, it has sliders and graphs and all of these, you know, scientifically visualization type things, not uh, pie charts and stuff like that. There's no pie chart in LabVIEW. OK, so we're going to talk a little bit about the evolution of the compiler. And LabVIEW is compiled. For a lot of people, that is kind of a surprise, because if you work with it, uh, you don't really see a compiled stage. If you work in a text language that's a compiled environment, then typically you're going to see something like you, you write your text, and then you start CC something, and then you get an output of that, and that goes to the linker. In LabVIEW, you don't see that. You're on a diagram, you work with the diagram, you, you modify it, edit it, you press the run button, and it runs. In the background, when you're editing the diagram, the, the, the compile environment is constantly checking for grammatically correctness. The whole semantic flow in the diagram is, is checked. And when you actually press the start button, at that point, it has to do a minimal amount of calculation. And the PCs, the, the CPUs are so fast right now that it's, uh, it, it's, it's invisible. Uh, LabVIEW users are not aware of a compile and link cycle in general. But it does get compiled. So that little piece of code over there gets compiled in this assembly language. Uh, yeah, right around here is actually an increment instruction that does the increment. So it is there. So the compiler basically keeps, keeps track of all your memory management, thread allocation, the syntax of the language. At any time, it does. Um, the whole semantic analysis of the language. And I don't know if it's still true today with compilers, but one of the things that annoyed me to no end in the earlier years was that you would s sit on your screen, you would type your C code, and then you say CC, and it compiles it, and it tells you you're missing a semicolon. Well, why didn't you tell me that while I was editing the file? No, I have to go all the way, wait for the end, and then it says you're missing a semicolon. You fix that, and then it says the error at the next line, because it couldn't quite figure out that with that missing, the other thing was wrong. And 
it's, it's all these little things that make the lab view environment so efficient in uh, developing code. Because you always know that your diagram is semantically correct and will compile. Otherwise, you cannot push that little run button here. The button's broken. If you click on it, it will tell you right away why, why it's broken. Um, so that makes it very nice. Now, the original lab here, 1986, so that was the date it started, uh, was still interpreted. That was kind of the first big experiment where the founders of the company were trying to um, find a better way for people to do instrumentation. And they wanted to do something that would um, take the front panel of an instrument, show that on the front panel, show that on, the, on your computer screen, and work with it as if you were working like with an Agilent or a Roden Schwartz or instruments like that with knobs and dials and, and push buttons. Um, and that kinda, that's where it came from. Now, pretty soon they saw that A, it was too slow, and B, the memory was, the memory use was too much. Now, this was developed on a Mac because it was the only computer at the time that had the 32-bit environment. All the PCs were still 16-bit, and this stuff does not run in 16-bit. Uh, and they didn't want to get in all that, you know, base pointer addressing crap and on an Intel chip. So they went with a 68,000 at 32 bit. But even in that environment, uh, there was so little memory in these computers that they couldn't just throw memory away. One of the problems when you have a data flow language is that whenever a wire splits, you know, you have these wires going from in inputs to up, from outputs to inputs. When a wire splits, you really have to make a copy of the memory structure. Because this wire here might be clobbered on by somebody else. Somebody might increment this. And that other wire, somebody might do something with. So you cannot just pass pointers. Because if you pass a pointer, if this guy increments, let's say, an array with one, and the other side is going to use what? The pre-increment, the post-increment, well, it's a pointer. You don't know. So there's a, an awful amount of copies that have to be made. So the first optimization they did was what's called an in-place algorithm. And it's a heuristic algorithm. It goes through the code and tries to figure out if there are places where it can just use the pointer. Now, the end user will never see pointers. There are no pointers in LabVIEW. There are no variables in LabVIEW, really. Uh, so it's, it's, it's quite different. But internally, if it sees that an optimization can be made, it will use a pointer. And that's an in-place algorithm. Um, if you really want to optimize your code visually, we have a way, it's a little option, where you can see where LabVIEW actually makes copies. And then you can sometimes change the code yourself to say, oh, if I, I can prevent, because I'm smarter than the compiler, I can prevent these copies from being made. I'm going to do some re rearranging of my code. So the in-placer would show that. It determines where a copy needs to be made, but it, and it's going to give more weight for arrays and clusters. Clusters are the lab you name for a struct. So if it sees something that could be big, it's going to give more weight to that and optimize the code around it and says, if I have to duplicate a wire here, and I can duplicate a scalar, or I can duplicate an array, I'm going to duplicate the, the scalar. Uh, but as it is done at, at uh, any time, it doesn't know the size of the array. So it cannot optimize for that. And it's propagated from the bottom up. So here we have a little piece of code. Um, an array and a scalar goes into a, what's called a sub-VI. It's basically a function call. But it doesn't know yet whether it can keep, let's see if this works here, whether it can keep this array in the same location as this array. It doesn't know that yet. It has to go figure that out by going to, to find out what this guy does. OK, if this is the code for this piece here, then you see the array comes in. I'm going to index something out of it, get an index, check for something. And then something else happens. This is a sub-VI, which is something, let's say, here that increments. At this point, 
I know that no copies are required in here because there's only one array, same array in, same array out, same array in, same array out. So it knows that everything can be done with a pointer. Now if I add something here on the code, now here because this guy changes the wire and this guy changes the wire, we're going to have to make a code because this piece of the wire here cannot be the same copy as this one. So it's a branched wire, so it has to make a copy. When we got to LabVIEW 2, about four years later, um, we finally made a full uh, code generator for it. So now we are going to a compiler before it was still interpreted. In practice, that meant that LabVIEW 2 was the first time, really, that people could start using LabVIEW for decent size applications. Uh, before, there was more little things in the lab. Starting LabVIEW 2, we could, in MeasureX, as Ed knows, we started um, with the LabVIEW 2 for prototyping of our systems. But it was only available on the uh, 68,000. LabVIEW 2.5 to 4, uh, so now we're talking 92 to 96, a bunch of things were added to the language. Up to this point, it was pretty much the only um, numeric uh, data type was of extended float. So now we started adding integers, structures, uh, logical, a lot more data types were being added uh, to the language. Um, and now also full, uh, full structs. So complex uh, data types. The only optimization we really had was constant folding. If we saw that a piece of code uh, could be generated at any time, we would generate that at any time. Like, for example, here. You have a for loop. You say do it 100 times and take what you read from the front panel, multiply it by i, and i goes is the index in the for loop, and the output becomes a, uh, an array. Yeah. That you cannot optimize because this variable can change on the front panel. But here, this piece of code, three times the index, do it 100 times, create an array. This whole thing we would precompile and um, already determine what this array would consist of. So that's called constant folding. Up to this end also, all the optimizations we're doing are done at the, at the, the lab view front end. It is done at the level of what the user sees. We have no intermediate language. We go from the, the diagram that you see to the assembly back end in kind of one step. So that also means that all the optimizations we're doing have to happen at that level of the language, which is not really a good way. Because it means your optimization can only work if you can translate it into something that the language itself already does. So for example, constant folding, we can replace that for loop with an array that's pre-computed, because LabVIEW has a pre-computed array. But if you want to do something that's a lot more complex than that, if you cannot translate it into what the language already has, we couldn't get very far. The same in C. It would be the equivalent of saying I have a piece of C code, and, and the compiler is going to optimize it by rewriting the C code for you. But if you cannot express it as part of C, it wouldn't do it. So that's about the level we were at um, at this time. So. Um, starting from five, we're adding multi-threading, and I'll go to that in a second, and also loop invariant code motion, which is basically if you have a piece of code in, let's say, a for loop that can be moved outside the for loop, we will do that also. And we're beginning to work on a back end in an intermediate language. Uh, a bunch of professors from Texas got, uh, University got involved, and it really, it really was a failure. We could never bring that to market. And the problem was that it took too much CPU time. And what it did was it took away that user experience. And user experience was very important to us. It took away the user experience of 
editing a VI, clicking the run button, and see it run right away. Now there were 10 seconds in between. You would push the button and wait. And people were not used to that. And we didn't really want to change that user interface. Uh, that, and not user interface, but the user experience. So basically, we didn't get very far with the, with, with the back end at that point in time. But what did happen was um, we went from a single threaded environment where everything was done with uh, cooperative multitasking to a fully multi-threaded, multi-core system with um, operating system defined uh, multi-threading. At that point, it became preempted, yes. Uh, before, it was cooperative. Now, in co with cooperative multitasking, what we would do is we would have what we called clumps. So in the diagram, if you take a big LabVIEW diagram, instead of looking at every execution of every primitive that we have and then go check the scheduler to see if there's anything else available to be done somewhere else on some diagram or some VI, we would say we're going to take a piece of code, clump it together, and we're only going to check that scheduler when this clump is done. So it goes to a little bit more... Uh, uh, not that fine-grained, because it was otherwise it would be too. Uh, it would take too long. So now we take a clump of data and check for it. So since LabVIEW five, and that was also very much uh, because with the company I was working uh, for at the time, we were a process control company. We were really requiring this from National Instruments because we needed to be fully multi-threaded. Uh, operating system, uh, operating environment. So now we went to one thread where we had uh, the UI interface. It's running in one thread. And then all these different VIs, all these different pieces of code can now run in their own thread. And in general, it's transparent to the end user. You don't have to write, in LabVIEW, you do not write any threading code. You don't have to make any calls to operating system stuff that says, OK, I want you to multi-thread this. You have one VI, you duplicate it, you have two VIs, you press the start button on one, the start button on the other, you're multi-threaded. Uh, if you're in one VI and you have, you have one time loop that says execute every 100 milliseconds, you duplicate that, you have two loops with no wire between them, then these two loops will run independently and they can run in different threads. So, if you want to write multi-threaded code in an environment like C, you have to write sometimes a whole page of code to make that work. Uh, here you don't. And if you stay within the LabVIEW paradigm, which sometimes some people have problems with, if you stay within the paradigm and you don't use variables, you kind of are guaranteed not to run in a lot of uh, runtime problems. And, um, because the, the, the code runs independently. And if you want to communicate between them, you use queues, uh, semaphores, whatever, but you don't use just global variables. Because global variables in multi-threaded environments can cause a lot of uh, a lot of problems. And that are very difficult to debug. So if you go multi-core, then basically some of these threads just go to the other four. Now, an interesting story behind this is that at the time I was working for MeasureX, I was not working for NI, and we were building up a, a, a very large process control system, controlling uh, paper systems. And this pap paper is made at 100 kilometers an hour, it's 10 meters wide sheet, so and we, we have to measure the paper, but we can't touch it. So we have a whole bunch of infrared and nuclear sensors to measure all the properties. And all of that was controlled with LabVIEW. Now, we had started our development on LabVIEW 2. We shipped our first prototype system to Goodyear tires <coughs> on LabVIEW 4. And after a long struggle in the company, we finally won the battle, and the whole company switched to LabVIEW, including our paper system division, which was by far the largest. And up to that point, we had really ridden the, the growth of the CPU. We started on a 46, 50 megahertz. The first system shipped to like 100 megahertz Pentium 1. 
Uh, then the first paper systems, now we're already talking 400 megahertz Pentium 2s. And we were, the group was had expanded to 20 to 30 people. And we were beginning to write more code than how the CPUs were getting faster and faster. We were out writing the CPUs. And so for our largest paper system, suddenly we had a problem that we, we couldn't execute it anymore. We, we ran into a CPU limit. So what we did, though, because these systems are $2 million systems, $1 to $2 million systems, we just told management, why don't you buy a Dell four-core CPU machine? And I'm now talking about the early 90s, mid-90s mid by now. Um, these were not cheap computers. They probably were $10,000 computers, and they had four big CPUs in it. And we took all the LabVIEW code. We didn't change a wire of code. We didn't change anything whatsoever. We just put it on a new computer, started it up, and all the code distributed itself over the four CPUs, and problem solved. Um, it took an eye marketing another 10 to 15 years before they saw really the big value of that, until the, the CPUs became multi-core, and every day, everybody had a multi-core machine on their desktop. And now, of course, it's a big marketing thing, you know, writing multi-core, multi-threaded applications in LabVIEW. Well, we did it about 10, 15 years earlier. And uh, we had already written, because we were all control engineers, we already had written all the code by defining the different subsystems and the different priorities and all of that, uh, right? Even if we were in a single-threaded, single-core system, we already had done all that work. So we could just um, put it on the other machine and it worked beautifully. So here you see a little bit these clump things. Um, this thing is going to be divided in one clump here where we're reading what's on the front panel, comes from the user interface. Then we have one piece of code that is that for loop here, another piece is this one, and then finally uh, we're going to go when the wires come back together, the rest will be the other clump. So these are the clumps. Clump zero here is going to be stopped, goes to sleep when we start doing that, and we do this, and then when it comes back again, then this clump gets restarted. So that's clump one, and clump two, and clump zero. So the way it executes, we first read what's on the front panel, then we go it goes to sleep because it's stopped now. This piece starts to execute, this piece starts to execute, and then it comes back again to completion of the diagram. Starting with LabVIEW 6, um, 2005 on, we're beginning to get uh, a lot more serious on what we can do with optimizations. And now we're really beginning to work on that back end and the code generator. Uh, we're doing uh, dead code elimination. Uh, I'll, I'll show some examples of that. An unreachable code elimination. Um, and we had figured out already that really these optimizations, we have to make them work in an intermediate language, not going back to the, the, the lab code itself. So what we're developing now is a data flow intermediate representation. It's still a data flow diagram, but it is much closer to the machine and not visible to the end user. And we're doing optimizations at that level. And then that gets, so we do a bunch of transforms on the code, and from there it goes to the target machine code. And instead of doing that ourselves, we now use LLVM, the low level virtual machine, which is an open source a uh, compile environment that I think is used by is used by Apple for uh, their Clang uh, LLVM uh, compile environment, and there's a whole bunch of other uh, companies that use it. Um, what that also gives us is the capability to go to a lot more targets in the end, uh, instead of just the 68,000 in the Intel and then some other. Uh, uh, CPU architectures we had supported in the past with a lot of effort, it's now a lot easier to go to a, a new CPU architecture as long as LLVM supports it. 
it's still not quite as simple as saying as just compiling because LabVIEW comes with a whole bunch of runtime environment and because the runtime environment which does all of our real-time and scheduling and the cooperative multitasking which is still there within one VI you can just say oh if you have a compiler for an ARM chip you're gonna have LabVIEW for ARM no we need to still have that rather big runtime environment which also handles everything on the user interface uh, all of that has to be compiled for that environment so it's still not that trivial but to go for the, the piece that's in the VI itself the code that you write to have that go to another architecture that's fairly easy now some of the metrics we get out of it um, speed improvements going from you know 10 percent to 48 times um, and we've been doing that every year from LabVIEW 209 to 10, 11. We keep on getting uh, better and better at it. We are paying a price, of course. Compile time has gone up, but the CPUs have now gotten so much faster that it's still invisible to the end user. Because the VI, the, the, the piece of code you work with, has not gotten five times larger it's still about the same size as it should be. It's not because your compiler gets faster that you have to write C codes that are 25 pages long. No, it's still going to be about, you know, reasonable size. So the compile times, the fact that it has gone up really hasn't bothered people. Um, there are also areas that don't get any faster. Calls to hardware. You know, now we have all these boxes with all of our instruments in it. Um, Cost to hardware, yeah, they don't change. If you tell it, give me one million data points from a vector signal analyzer, uh, it still has to get these at whatever the acquisition rate for the devices, so that, that doesn't change. If we call DLLs from uh, Windows or whatever the, the environment is we're running under, that doesn't change. To the user to leverage these speedups, it's mostly automatic. They don't see it. There's a couple that they can do uh, themselves manually. <clears throat> Turn debugging off. Um, if debugging is on, we obviously keep track of a lot more things. You can click on any one of these wires and put a probe on it. Um, unlike other environments, because, I, because everything is graphical, the probes we have can also be graphical. So if you have a wire in a diagram that is an array, you can click on it and it shows you a graph of what goes to the array. If you have something that's a scalar, we can say put um, a kind of a time graph on it where you're going to see how that variable changes over time as a graph, not just as a very fast number of set of numbers that flash in your face. Now you can see it as a, as a graph. Um, but then when you've debugged something, turn it off. Uh, VIs can be inlined where basically all the code of that sub-VI gets moved into your main VI uh, at the compile stage, not at the visual stage. You, you won't see that. So a lot of the things that you see in typical text-based language environments are now seeping into the, the labby environment also. So how does that data flow language look like? For example, this little piece of code here, you, uh, you bring up a dialog box, say, are you ready, and then you generate a random number and format it, that gets now translated into another graphical piece of code which is bigger because it has more primitives in it. Uh, nobody sees that except for our compiler people in Austin. That is not visible to the end user. But the optimizations now happen at this level, not anymore at the other level. So what the optimizations that can happen are decompositions where we basically take a piece of code and we just translate into another piece of code that is um, more visible what it does. This is kind of esoteric. It's, this is called a feedback node. Uh, it's not really the way you do things in lab. You originally that was done with the shift register. So this piece of code gets translated into that. Um, Another one is if we have a for loop, 
and you want to parallelize it. So you can put this little index in here and says, parallelize this for whatever CPUs you have. And then this piece of code gets transformed into this here. So what you see here, for example, is you take an input array and you add i to it. So if an input array is, let's say, 0 to 1,000, uh, or some sine wave, you're now going to add 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 to each of the next elements of the array. And then that gets parallelized into four for loops, where the first array gets split into four loops, four arrays, each of, let's say, 250 elements, 250 elements, 250 elements, 250, if you have 1,000 elements. And then that part where you add that i can happen on each of the subsections of the array. And in the end, we put them all back together. So all of this is done automatically. If the user over there just says, I want to parallelize that code, that's all he has to do. And that for loop will then distribute itself over four CPUs. Doesn't make a lot of sense for this little thing, but change this piece of code to some image processing or some FFT part or something that can be done as on, on a section of the array at a time, then that becomes very important. And that gives you a lot, especially now with these eight core machines. You can get uh, quite a lot of uh, speed ups. Simple things. Uh, now, these are the optimizations. Uh, common sub-expression elimination. If you compute the same thing, take it out. Unreachable code. Uh, if you have a case statement, like here, this case statement here is add noise, do not add noise and you wire a constant to it, so then at runtime, at any time, you already know uh, that this one will not execute, so the whole case is taken out anyway. This is dead code elimination. If you have a for loop and you compute a bunch of stuff and you have these wires, you see these with the red circles around it, they're going out, but nobody uses them. Why compute that stuff that makes that wire so that's taken out? That's called you know, dead code elimination. And finally, you can, this is then that uh, uh, loop invariant code. Some of the portions over there will not change. So some of these pieces of code here will not change. You take 15, which is fixed, multiplied by this number here. All of that can be moved out. And the only thing that's still variable in the loop is this two array minuses. So here we do something where we are going to remove the white space. That little purple thing here is the white space elimination. And we're going to go through that. This is inlining. The code is now inserted into the main piece of code. Then here we can see that the only portion that's going to execute is that, because we say uh, eliminate from start of string, so one case can go away. Here we say uh, this is going to be a case that does nothing, and we end up with this. Then the sequence structure can be delayed, can be taken out. The match pattern primitive doesn't change because now we have two constants going in, and the whole thing changes to this. Again, these optimizations happen at the data flow intermediate representation, not at the LabVIEW code. It's at one lower. Then we also will generate, uh, if the CPU has SSC instructions for like matrix or, or vector stuff, and we'll do some optimization on scalar stuff, uh, but that's kind of <clears throat> totally behind the scenes. And then in addition to the one that we get on the defer stuff, the LLVM will give us a lot of optimizations at the back end because it knows about the registers. It, it will do all the register optimization and everything that typically happens at the lower end, something that in the past we would have had to spend a lot of time doing ourselves for the different CPU architectures that we were supporting. Now we all get that for free. Okay, are there any questions about this? Yes. What do you guys about using uh, open 
Yes. Uh, yeah, make sure you uh, so or I can or I can repeat. I, I repeat. Yeah. So the question was have we done anything with uh, using uh, GPUs uh, for algorithm um, to run them faster? And yes we have. We have algorithms and they run at the VI, so you just have one sub VI that will do the GPU calls. We have used CUDA so far. Um, it's been important in some of our uh, physics environments. Um, one area where uh, we've made a lot of progress is in what we call big physics. And big physics is uh, Lawrence Livermore Labs, uh, ESO, the Extremely Large Telescope, um, Fusion Research. And they need to do a lot of stuff real time. Um, and so they can't miss certain control operations. And it's usually a lot of work. To give you an example, um, I might be able to show that. I don't know how well it's going to come across, though. That's not it. Let me just see. I'm going to go through this fast, but I probably can show you some of them. Um, So here, for example, Max Planck, it's a fusion reactor. Um, the big problem with the fusion research is when that plasma goes around, you have to keep it stable. And it's very much like pushing a balloon. When you push it here, it pops up somewhere else. And doing that, you have to be very, very fast at your control algorithms. So there we're using an eight-core system. Uh, this is some of their quotes. It's 20 times faster, they turned out. Um, and we have to do, uh, we have four beams. We're gathering data at 100 kilohertz to 2 megahertz. And then we're doing 100 hertz to 1 kilohertz control loops. You do that over a three-dimensional plasma, and the amount of calculations goes way up. And then we might say one of these algorithms, if it's a very compute-intensive one, will execute on a, on a GPU. The lab itself will not run on a GPU. We're not that far yet, but the algorithms will. Uh, here we're running 92 channels at 1 giga samples per second. We need to have very tight synchronization between the different boxes. And yeah, CERN is an interesting one. Um, in CERN, we are running the collimation, the collimation of the beam. If the collimation of the beam doesn't go right and the beam goes a little bit out of its area, the energy in just the protons going, a bunch of protons going around, it can melt like 500 kilograms of copper. So. They, 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 yeah, they try to shoot it off into an area where it's not going to do damage, damage. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> yeah, so here we have 120 of these uh, PXI. PXI stands for PCI with instrumentation extensions. It's basically a PCI bus, but we have added a bunch of lines for uh, very tight synchronization and timing between the different modules uh, in the backplane. Um, and they're all controlled using a real-time Ethernet. Uh, the controls run on an FPGA. Um, it's typically what you have on a on a normal PC. It's it's nothing special. It's a uh, Intel, yeah, the three gigahertz whatever type. Yeah, I I, I don't think at, at this point this I don't think we're CPU bound. It's more the, the overall timing and synchronization between all the different systems. We also run a good portion of the control on an FPGA. Now, that's definitely something that has changed since the last time we talked here, because um, 
we also now have a version of LabVIEW. It's the same language, the same semantics, the same environment that you use, but it gets targeted to an FPGA. And it allows um, electrical and mechanical engineers to write to a FPGA without going through a two-year computer science course on writing VHDL. Uh, is it going to be the most efficient FPGA code? Absolutely not. It's going to be wasting your gates left and right compared to somebody who is really versed in writing VHDL. Dancing bear, though, is not how well it dances. Yeah. <laughs> It's the fact that he dances. And it, for a lot of people, it makes a difference between being able to do something or not do it at all. Um, we have a company that does a motorcycle engine control. And they buy a normal Japanese motorcycle, and they want to tune it for very high performance. So they change the engine controller. So they use some of our stuff, and you can, you know, we can measure Oh, the, the gas pedal and the uh, brake pedal and the air temperature and atmospheric pressure and temperature of the engine and all of these type of things. And that's done real time. That runs on a real time OS like uh, VxWorks or something. Runs standard LabVIEW. But then there's the portion where you want to do the timing of the, uh, the spark plugs. Now, you can't miss that. If you miss a a temperature reading and you get it half a second later, no big deal. It's more an optimization. It says, okay, where do my timing, where the timing should go? But you can't really miss any one of the spark plug firings or the engine is going to go bonkers. So these motorcycles are riding around with LabVIEW on board? Oh, yeah. So this isn't just in the factory? It's yeah, and that's not on a big PXI chassis. That's on another piece of hardware we have, which is more, much more hard and much smaller. It's about this size. And these machines run at, you know, 10,000, 12,000 RPM. And then the code that actually does the timing that we run on an FPGA. Um, for people like that, when they run that development environment, they need to be fast. They cannot really do the massive development that the General Motors does for an engine controller. No, they have to be... And when they finally figured it out, afterwards they might put the whole code back into some little... In an application like this one, the CERN, the, the PXI systems, uh, is LabVIEW running standalone or is it on top of a real-time OS? LabVIEW always runs on top of something, and in that case it runs on a real-time OS. So it's VxWorks or yeah. CarLab or something yeah, else? exactly. Uh, depending on the hardware we have, it's, it's in the past it was FarLab, then we moved to VxWorks. Yeah. Uh, are you doing PCI or PCI Express? Uh, both. Oh. Repeat, repeat the question. Yeah, the question was if the whether these PXI systems are based on PCI or PCI Express. The ones from ten years ago were PCI based. The modern ones can be PCI or PCI Express, and you can also get chassis that are a mix that allow you to do uh, both. One of the reasons we can also went to these chassis is that uh, the PC world has changed so much. We have 15, 20 years ago, your PC had a lot of slots. And every year we would see the number of slots go down. Because, well, they have Ethernet built in and they have sound built in and they have USB now, which doesn't require all these slots anymore for every card, everything you needed to do. So we saw the the slots disappearing on the PC. Yeah, but it was a crappy environment, too. That was the other problem. It was very noisy, very crappy. The connectors, you know, they vibrate loose. And so we, need to have so we needed to have something that mechanically was far more robust, that the connectors wouldn't come loose, that um, had a much better noise-controlled environment, uh, and also where we could add some of our own extensions, because we needed to do... Uh, these timing lines so that you can do if you have two data acquisition cards and you and they need to do simultaneous sampling of data the one card needs to know what the other card is doing and you cannot do that by just sending messages over the bus you know it has to be controlled like a very interesting application with that was for uh, I think it was Boeing 
where we have microphones that go on the runway in like a big logarithmic spiral, like 128 microphones. And all the microphones are sampled simultaneously. So that the, the, we get the sample at, I don't know, 30, 60, or 100 kilohertz or something at exactly the same time. So then what we can do is look at the phase differences and basically do like computer tomography and find out the sound level of when a plane lands and back compute to where it came in from space. So while the plane is landing, we can see where the sound comes from. Come, does it come from turbulence around the wheel wells? Does it come from the engine? Where does the sound come from? So that's a, an interesting one, but of course the timing there has to be extremely exact. That's why we have all these also these timing lines. And it, yeah. Um, so I noticed that uh, there were icons that let you call DLLs and things like yes. that. Um, and you've mentioned that, that there's no inherent speed up or anything like that, which is understandable. Um, is there a means with LabVIEW which you can write extensions or LabVIEW specifically? In other words, something that will be able to take advantage of some of the... Oh, but yeah, not really, because the speed ups I've been talking about are the LabVIEW compiler optimizations. Obviously, what you write in your DLL is already optimized because of your compiler, because you, you, you write a piece that gets compiled in assembly anyway. Right. So none of these optimizations that we're doing here really apply to what happens in your DLL. So maybe, I'm, okay, so that's the DLL, but I guess what I, let me rephrase that. Is there a way to write new primitives for the language? Oh, okay. Um, primitives, no. No, you can write, yeah, the end user cannot write new primitives. But that's about the same as saying, can I come up with new primitives in C? You really can't either. I mean, you can write functions, and you can call them a primitive, but they're not real primitives. I mean, the C compiler will have the different things. The plus is a plus. You cannot make a new plus that will be assembled into another machine instruction. No, that's at the compiler level. But you could write a function in C yeah. and call it from LabVIEW. Oh, yes, very absolutely. Easy. Oh, very easily. That's been around since. That's been around for a long very time, yes. Yeah, and a lot of people use that. If, for example, you have a big numeric library, and you have already a library done with some very complex numerics in it, and it's like an array in, two arrays in, and one array out. Keep your code. Absolutely. As long as you use the same calling sequences that the DLL would have. You may want to repeat the question. Yeah. yeah, I mean, can you write something in assembly that LabVIEW would call? Yeah, as long as you follow, as long as you write in assembly something that looks like a DLL, then mm -hmm. yes. Can the reverse happen? In other words, can a C program call into a LabVIEW? Yeah. Yes. Yes, that happens also. Uh, one of the things we can do, um, you can run your lab view code by just pushing the start button. That requires, you know, the whole lab view environment. You need to have the runtime, the edit environment, the whole thing, for which you pay. That's your development environment. You can also build an EXT. There's an application builder. You take all your lab view VIs, everything you have, and you say, build me an EXT. Or build me an EXT, including an, an, uh, an installer. Out comes an installer setup.exe. You click that. You give it to somebody on a floppy, and they well, not a floppy anymore. Dating <laughs> uh, myself. You put it on a USB stick, and they can stick it in their system, install it. It has the runtime. It has everything with it, and that typically is free. So you can do runtimes for free. Another thing you can do is you can build a DLL, so that your whole lab view environment gets embedded into one DLL with an API that you can now call from your C environment. You can also do something that is gives you remote access, where your LabVIEW environment is controllable from your C or any language that can send it commands, basically you know, over TCP IP or something like that. Speaking of uh, yeah. remote access, uh, 
say I wanted to run my oscilloscope and the rest of my lab experiment from my office or run my telescope from my uh, my office uh, down at the bottom of the hill. Yeah. Well, there's a couple of ways of doing that. One would be your typically remote desktop type where you you run, uh, yeah, you, you duplicate the user environment on your machine. That's one, a remote desktop application. Another one would be over networking when you give it uh, the, the commands, the IP commands. And at that level, you can put in all the security and whatever you want yourself. But you kind of have to program that in. Uh, so LabVIEW has the facility to make a web page out of your LabVIEW VI. Um, yeah, there is a facility. It doesn't quite go as far as we would like because it still requires you to have the runtime environment on your system. Because if you bring up a web page that is really like a LabVIEW front end, it still needs to have something there that is going to visualize these graphs and because HTML doesn't quite do that. And it has to be fast because it has to react the same way as our graphs. Um, now, we also have RESTful services. So you can build up a web page using your standard web page environment where you basically get variables from us. And you just give the HTML command, you know, like with a question mark, query, whatever. And then there's a, lab view, a piece of lab view code that you write where you basically define these RESTful services to get data onto your web page. So there, there are multiple ways to, to skin that cat. And of course, these days, we have an iPad interface where you, you have the whole diagram, and you connect to global variables, and the, the networking is taken care of. And, uh, but that's really only beginning. Uh, we're not, there's, there's a way to go on that to make it fully, uh, fully interactive. Yeah. There was still a question over there in the back. Okay, one thing more here, like on, on CERN, over 27 kilometer distance, jitters in microseconds, so it's all uh, these ones I'm going to skip. Okay, that's an interesting one. That is, I think work has started on some of the, the building parts, but it's not fully funded yet, but they already are starting some of the work. It's so a 42 meter diameter telescope. The primary mirror M1 has um, pretty much about a thousand mirrors. As a comparison, the Keck telescope, which is the, the largest in the world, has 35. A segment about a meter. Now, the load on these mirrors, wind load, vibration, whatever, and, and just change in the shape of the, the whole structure uh, means that you have to dynamically control the position of these mirrors. So all these little segments here, all 984 of them, have behind them uh, actuators to change their position. Typically three actuators, a uh, combination of voice coil or something, and then they have six uh, sensors, they're ex exogenal, so six uh, edge sensors, so they can measure the difference, uh, the distance between the edges of one mirror versus the other one on all six edges. So this becomes a problem of 3 times 984 is 2,000, 3,000 actuators and 6,000 sensors. And they want to control that on a one millisecond rate. So every time, every millisecond, they want to do like have that whole surface become a perfect optical surface again. And of course, if you change one mirror a little bit to make it fit the other one, then the other edges move. So then all the other ones around it have to move, which means all the other ones around that have to move. So it basically becomes a convolution problem. A little bit like our cross-direction of control in, in the MeasureX system. You push the beam here, then it triples it. Uh, so to do that, uh, we ran like a 64-core Dell server, multiple boards, and the lab code distributed itself over it to do the array manipulations. Does it do uh, one round of corrections every millisecond? Yep. Okay. 
change all of yours at one time? You have to change. We change all of them at the same time. So yeah. yeah, it's just a computational issue. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now this is still an easier. This is this is not adaptive optics. This is just so that the mirrors becomes a perfect mirror in a perfect condition. Yeah. The the South African telescope is. So if this this thing is you're not doing. No, no, there's no that is flat. <coughs> exactly. Set of oh, yeah. On the yes. Work yeah. Yes. This is an easier problem in that there's only 3,000. It's a 3, 3K by 6K. The adaptive optics problem is about one magnitude more. This one we already have working. Uh, this one, well, I mean, we have it working in that we have it totally simulated and we can keep up with the controls and we can, you know, we can do the controls. The adaptive optics one is still not quite there yet. Uh, because they have, it's a mirror, I think the mirror is about one meter or two meters something. The secondary it might be yeah. bigger than that, but the number of actuators they have in it is larger. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's very uh, large. Something called vertical volume. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's uh, yeah, that's even even more. Okay, this is yeah, this is the M4, the deformable mirror. This is a little example of it. I saw that a couple of years ago. Uh, they're still working on it. Um, but yeah, that's adaptive optics. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Now the mirror itself has to be in phase, yes. which means that when you uh, when you take that 42 meter mirror, all the segment edges have to be within lambda over 10 wavelength over 10, because they have to be in phase, where the um, uh, telescopes I worked on in South Africa, that one also has about 30, 40 segments, but uh, they are not in phase. Basically, they made a 10 meter telescope for like $35 million, which is a tenth of the cost of the, of the keg. So they have the light gathering, which is important, but they do not have the same resolution because each of the segments has to be um, uh, focused and has to be, you know, pointing to the right point, but they don't have to be within lambda over 10. They can be a millimeter off for all that they care. Does the scope use It's mainly used for spectroscopy. It doesn't matter. Yeah, so they, they made a conscious decision that they would never, ever get adaptive optics. Because to do adaptive optics, your mirror has to be in phase. Yeah. Uh, so they know they're not going to get that. Uh, they know they're not going to get the resolution. But without adaptive optics, they wouldn't get the resolution anyway. You know, basically my own telescope at home, the resolution is not much worse than the big hail telescope you have, you know, in LA. That big five meter one. Because turbulence kills your resolution anyway. Yes. No, the information already went away. But, uh, can, yeah. What's the question? Can you after after the image is past the focal plane and into the data? Can you tweak it? And there are some things you can do, but the answer is no. The the data, the information is gone. Yeah. Yeah. There are certain ways because people now do even like uh, uh, even when you have like a piece of matte glass and you don't see anything through it, 
they now are beginning to have ways to see yeah. what's on the other side. Back out looking at the space telescope, even though the figure of the mirror wasn't quite right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, That's for enhance. Yeah. yeah. Now, looking at all these applications, are all extremely interesting, and they're all fun to look at and fun to work with, but. I want to caution that that is not really the majority of what my company does. If we would be doing that, we wouldn't be a billion dollar company. We would have a loss probably. <laughs> because a lot of these things, it's, uh, this telescope is going to be another 10 years. Okay. Um, it's interesting, we're very interested in it because it pushes the envelope. It pushes the envelope on computation, it pushes the envelope on synchronization, on timing. We've learned a lot on, on, on timing uh, systems that are geographically separate. Um, so it, it is very interesting. But really, the majority of the work we do is much more esoteric stuff. You know, a lot of the, you know, Tesla, the batteries, you know, they have to be, all the batteries have to be tested. Your phones have to be tested on Wi-Fi and all the, the seller standards. Your set-top box has Wi-Fi chips in it. We need to test that. It's amazing the the math that goes behind some of these wireless standards. It is it's it's unbelievable how they make it work. You know, you think about you know frequency shift keying and all of that, and you get like one bit out of it. Now it's 64 quadrature amplitude modulation. They have 64 points that they have to get correct, uh, the bandwidths are orders of magnitude more, you know, your Wi-Fi AC is now 80 or 160 megahertz bandwidth signal in the 5 gigahertz uh, range. So um, the data gathering and the data analysis of that is, is becoming very, very complex. And that's, it, it's these type of things. And all the simple applications of uh, building monitoring um, you know, bridge monitoring is the, the infrastructure in the U.S. is, is crumbling. Uh, we need to go monitoring, you know, a lot of that. Um, that's applications, oil and gas, uh, yeah, chip testing uh, at the wafer level. Uh, I think you alluded briefly yeah. to smart buildings. Are there? Is there a lot of lab you in, in the smart building? Um, the big application I know of is the, the bird's nest on the Olympic Games in uh, Beijing. That big bird's nest building uh, that has a lot of lab view stuff in it and lab and sensors and ice sensors for vibration and that kind of stuff. Um, smart buildings, I, I, I don't know. Yeah. We'll do a lot. Yeah, we. we, we it's a lot of manufacturing tests and, and other other testing. Are there other products you could tell us about? The, the motorcycle where the lab is actually going out on the road. I know ShotSpotter. ShotSpotter is a lab view out in their product. Their yeah, does product. everybody know what ShotSpotter is? Mm -hmm. is Basically. Okay then. Okay, just a couple. It's. Uh, uh, a company, Silicon Valley company, and they do triangulation and location of gun. So they uh, sell it. Two major customers they have is uh, municipalities, think East Palo Alto, think Auckland, uh, and the military. And what they can find out is really amazing. Let's, for example, in in uh, Iraq. Uh, when a bullet comes by, these bullets are all supersonic. They have you have a, um, you have a shock wave at the point of the bullet, and you have one at the end of the bullet. The the time it takes to go from this to here, when they pick up that sound, they can tell you the caliber of the bullet. Then, if they have the sound of where it was shot, they can find out from where it was. So not only do they kind of have the type of the bullet, they know where it's being shot. What they do, like in um, East Palo Alto, is you know just finding out how many times are there shots and and where are they shot and where should the police go. 
they had a case, I think, one or two years ago where in uh, Oakland, uh, somebody was shot in broad daylight in a intersection. Just the guy just falls dead, basically. And uh, police was called. They had shot spotter. Not only did they know where the guy was in the XY, they also knew that he was on the roof of one of the buildings. So the police went up the building, and the guy was still there, sitting in the sun, happy as a clam because his job was done. And he had no idea that the police would know that he was on top of the building because they got him. And they can tell the difference yep. fairly well between firecrackers yeah, and, and, a, and a, back, a car that backfires. Backfiring and, yep. and actual deadly yep. ordinance. Yep. Yep. And a lot of the analysis of the sound waves and the triangulation is, uh, is computed with LiveView. Um, and then we have, of course, you know, a lot of embedded things like the the the, the machines that make the chips, uh, wafer analysis, and all of that. We, we can be in it. Um, we do optical mitigation on the uh, Lawrence Livermore Labs, which is an interesting application. That might be something for another talk. Uh, we basically, they have 192 extremely high energy laser beams. And the beam, when it gets to the end, when it gets to that big uh, cylinder, not cylinder, but uh, a sphere, they try to get all the beams to come to one little point in the middle. And it's a um, hydrogen tritium, a little bulk, of a millimeter across or so, and they try to generate Now, before they get there, uh, they have an enormous facility. It's hundreds of meters long. And they start with a very little uh, laser pulse. gets amplified and amplified and optical amplification. It goes through these uh, large uh, glass, pieces of glass, this, this thick, this tall, from here to there about. And they get an enormous amount of flash. They flash it before, and then when the pulse of light comes through it, it gets amplified. It's an optical amplifier. And so they have 192 of these beams. So the beam in the end is about this size. It's a couple of feet by a couple of feet. And the energy is about 2 gigawatts per square inch. So it's tremendous energy. Now, I think this is still in the red. Right away, at the, all the way at the end, when all these beams are coming together, at the outside of that big sphere, they use some frequency multipliers. They go like a frequency tripler. And they get it into the ultraviolet. And then, after they get it into ultraviolet, they go through lenses. And these are all non-spherical lenses to get that beam, which is now this size, up to that very little point. Well, the problem they have is when they do a shot, after a couple of shots, the lenses get damaged because it's so much energy. You don't want that lens to have some kind of damage that would have a part of the energy of the beam go this way when it really should go this way. So they have to fix these lenses. And you can fix them by, uh, depending what the, how, how bad the, error, the, the problem is, you can kind of abrade it off, or you can drill a hole that then will disperse. O over that little part of the lens, the, the beam will get dispersed. But it will not focus on something where it shouldn't be focusing on. Uh, so they have to take these lenses out and then go scan the whole thing and then use another carbon dioxide laser to kind of melt the glass, anneal it, or uh, basically ablate some of the glass of it. That's all controlled with, with LabVIEW systems. Um, yeah? Um, with Tesla, we just do battery testing. Tesla doesn't do autonomous vehicles, but uh, we have been used quite a lot in like the DARPA uh, for the autonomous vehicles, the one that kind of go through the desert and run all their stuff. Yeah, some of the university teams have used us quite extensively. Tesla is just batteries. Tesla is nothing to autonomous vehicles. Yeah. They're working. They're working. They're, they have job rights. Yeah. But we're not uh, we're not working on that. Hmm. 
Um, we can be embedded in the machines that do the um, actual manufacturing because a lot of these have, you know, they need to have positioning. You need to have very fine positioning of a, of a test thing um, or, or a measurement thing where they measure planarity or whatever. They also can have, <coughs> they also can do part of the testing of the chips afterwards, more like a teradyne type. Um, so we're on we're on both ends. We're on the production end, and we're on the testing end. Yeah. Um, that depends very much what part of the business you're looking at. The question: uh, Who's our major competitor? When you're looking at high-end instrumentation, like going really, you know, doing uh, FFTs, frequency analysis, all of that, Agilent. Agilent would be a big competitor. Um, the difference is that Agilent makes box instruments where you buy the instrument. For us, software is the instrument. That's been kind of the, the slogan of the company since the first days. Uh, we make a box that doesn't really have any knobs on it. Uh, it can do anything you want. Um, we can add within that chassis. We can add ADCs. We can add digital I/O. We can add RF instruments, and you can just keep on adding till you run out of room. And there can be a whole bunch of different things. But it means that to control that, to work with it, you need to have your computer and with your interface, and that becomes the front end to the interface. Uh, we tend to be very horizontal in that we make the boards and we make the soft the, the compiler. And it's up to the end users to kind of put their systems together. We have a whole bunch of companies around our company that will do that for you. You know, they're just alliance members, we call them, and they will use our stuff. And they have the vertical knowledge. Typically, uh, for most of the business, uh, we don't want to get into the vertical part. If people use the stuff for a medical system, fine. But we're not experts in bio reactors, you know, uh, some other company will do that. Uh, but biotechnology is another area where we used a lot. The, the sequences for like uh, oh, DNA sequencing, well that's reading of a whole bunch of things, well that can be done by our stuff. And then it gets embedded. Yes? I um, just want to say five minutes, I think, yep. and then we'll have a 15 minute break after that. We're not, we're not strictly limited today because we've got kind of open-ended one of the speakers went away. I did want you to plug the lab you use this group. Uh, how often did you meet? Uh, once a quarter. And it's still free dinner? Uh, pretty much. Yeah? Pizza yeah. or something. Pizza or something, yeah. And it's now, we used to have it in like a hotel or so, now we have it in our office because the office got really expanded a lot. That's nice. You have the facility. Area, right? Yeah, it's in the Bay Area. It's right on, uh, very close to Great America. Great American? Okay. Yeah, Santa Clara. Yeah. No. Uh, again, that would be a vertical market. If somebody wants to make a 3D printer using our measurement stuff, fine. But we're not making a 3D printer. Yeah. But. Um, for all that I know, somebody might be might be doing that. Um, now, obviously, some of the stuff uh, that we have, when you look at that hardware, it's not cheap. So, also LabVIEW is, in comparison to other environments, not cheap. So we're not really gearing towards the hobby market where you want to do. Um, you know, like an Arduino board or something. We have interfaces to it, and obviously students can uh, get stuff at much better prices. Uh, but it's not the big push. Um, what is a big push for us is education. Basically, getting kids to stay in school and study engineering. 
That is a big thing for us, and we do a lot of sponsorship for that. Uh, I don't know if you know about FIRST. Uh, the FIRST robots, uh, we make all the controllers for them. So the controllers is, is that CUEO, it's a compact reader chassis which has an FPGA in the back plane, runs a real-time OS, runs LabVIEW. The teams that run FIRST, they can decide themselves, and usually that depends on their mentors, whether they're going to program in LabVIEW or whether they're going to program in C. Uh, so they have a choice. Um, we also do Lego Mindstorms. If you know the Lego Mindstorms, that brick, uh, that's basically LabVIEW. Mm -hmm. It's a very specialized version of LabVIEW, but we've worked with uh, Lego for many, many years. So it's, uh, it's, it's kind of a little bit like a drug pusher. You know, the first hits on us, it's free. <laughs> <laughs> First taste is free, and then once we get yeah. yeah, once people get to use it, and we've also seen, and we've done quite a bit of studies on it, the the efficiency of implementation, and I'm not talking about how much CPU time it uses, but the amount of time it takes a team to bring a, a project to completion. And that means from the moment you kind of know what you're going to do till you deliver it back free to the end user, that time, if compared to like doing it in Visual Basic, doing it in C, doing it in LabVIEW, we easily have a factor of three to five difference. So that's quite considerable. Making the best use of processor power, you mean? Arrays. Processor arrays. What do you mean by processor arrays? Oh, multi-core. Uh, it's trivial. To write a multi-core application in LabVIEW is trivial. Uh, um, it's problem here is that my screen is really, really small. Uh, I don't know if I can easily solve that. Let me see if I can just make a little example here. Yeah, this. Yeah. John, Dirk, Dirk talked about this paramount during this talk. So, for example, if I make a while loop, and I make the while loop do something, okay, I take, oh, uh, let's say I make a random number, and I stick it in an indicator, okay, and I execute it over a timing, let's say, I'm going to do this 10 times a second. OK, I can run that. OK, see the number change over there. All right, that's my, my program. Now I'm going to take this piece of code. Uh, and I'm going to make some rule here, control. Oops, don't have my mouse. OK, I'm going to make this one run at once a second, OK? Now I have two of, I don't know, the other one is somewhere here. Basically, I have now written a multi-threaded application. And if you have two cores, this can run on one core, that can run on the other core. There's nothing further you have to do. I have nothing I have to do. It's magic. Yeah. Yes. Well, you had like 100 threads, and you only had uh, 8 or 12 of them. 
Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we, well, if, if we would have a hundred of these, and we have only eight cores, the OS would say, you know, you you get you get split out over the cores, but then you still have the multi-threading. The OS will then say, okay, I'm going to give a little bit of time to this, then a little bit of time to that, and a little bit of time to this. Yes. And we can set priorities. Yes. And you can set priorities on these. And say, so this is the highest priority one. So, yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's running real-time stuff, but if you do this in C, it would be a whole page of code just to get this set up to run multi thread it will be a full page. Your whole screen will be full with code, and you haven't even done any of the calculations yet. Yeah, and you make one mistake in there, and you get yeah, you have a problem. And operating systems aren't particularly good at that without cutting up the task and moving it across. Whereas, whereas LabVIEW, as a function of the representation of the task, the data flow, and the description, it just happens without further intervention. You should have to, you as the programmer, shouldn't have to worry about it. Okay, so when am I going to have this piece running this month? Mm -hmm. you know, yep. So, so this is an, a little example of that that mirror thing. The screen is too small, so I had to already make stuff really small here. Uh, so now you see the seven mirrors. Now it's going to do all 500 mirrors. <laughs> or, or. Yeah. Yeah, about. Yeah. And this diagram is a little bit bigger than the other ones, but. Uh, yep. Anyway. That's it. No more questions? So well, I'll still be around, so. During the break, go to in the back. Yes, they're not free anymore. Do what you feel. If you don't know what to feel, grab the inside. Throw a bucket. Uh, Tim has a nice little demo. Haven't seen it yet. Have a look at it. Might have seen it in a little while. I think she's good. Okay. I hope you enjoyed it. Echo cancellation. No. Uh, I think this is yours or mine. That's yours. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's your that's that's your adapter, right? That is correct, yes. Right. Yep. Yep. Those mirrors up there was a part of your Um yeah, they're adaptive mirrors, but it's not uh can, can it's, it's not adaptive optics. Uh, no, that would just be making wrong. sure that the mirror second is perfect. <laughs> Doesn't change for uh, turbulence in the atmosphere. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, but for some reason, the, the droid cam doesn't make it into Google. Mm. I've got the droid cam here now. It's on my computer, but I can't get it into Google. It just won't go. Hey, that's great. Yeah, nice. I'm going to go the other way. Yeah, we do a lot of fun, fun things. After Matrix? Well, 
um, I had a lot of contacts in NI because of I had brought an eye into yeah, pretty much. I was their fox, as they call it, you know, their <coughs> inside, their inside guys. And I really, and I, oh yeah, I was already working. Actually, I told our CEO, I said, I've pretty much, I've done your marketing for 10 years, I've done your engineering for 10 years. Um, I've I've done your sales for 10 years. Exactly. Now you're going to have to pay me. Well, not quite. Of course, the, the problem was that uh, if you go to uh, Austin, that's where the action is. That's it, of course. Um, yeah, but I mean, career wise, it would be better if I'm there. But at this point in time, yeah, I don't want to leave the area. All my support is here. All my friends are here. Um, the weather is lovely. I don't want a 90 consecutive days of above 100 degrees. Um, there's definitely a cultural difference. Well, actually, Austin's not, not so Austin bad. is not so bad. I know. Uh, it's not all gun toting. Uh, it's not yeah. all. But there is a cultural difference. Now that you there is a cultural difference. Um, I know from people that go there and they said, you know, the first thing that happens, you, you're in the neighborhood and the neighbors come by and it says, oh, we welcome you to the neighborhood. And what shirts do you go to? <laughs> I'm to get my thing off here. So. Thank you. 
Nine chances out of ten, they've been up to So I try to keep up with it to all the latest versions. And so I've been solving it. But that's a whole lot easier than having to do that just to get email work. Does it have to restore points like the previous version? Yeah. You can use that as well. You can use that as well. I think, I think I have been hitting the truly dis destructive ones. Those won't be like um, some DMCs. Uh, virtual network. Uh, anything that's doing very low level stuff. Well, you were talking about Wireshark. Wireshark is for analyzing products. And there's a low level and now capture routine. Code. Like that code. A bunch of things to kill off. Of course, you have to be the one to figure that out. You find it out, and then you dead. And typically, it would take me a weekend to get back running. Here it's a few hours. And that's great. Now, it just happened to me as I started a contracting job the day before. <laughs> oh, no! It'd be good if they had a... Uh, <laughs> well, it's too early. It's too early. They don't know. Nobody wants to say 
I think they're so flexible. They have an incremental version of uh, the mosaic. Well, it's mostly the vendors that have to update their programs. They're getting the small outputs. But yeah, but yeah, I love it. It's still the best thing. Yeah, my college days. Cross the street, guys. That's my job. We got the you know number of got a deal on it. And for most people, those are fine. For a lot of people, this is fine. Yeah. But if you want to run. In the programming, anything that's not in the store, you have a problem. Video out? Yeah. Different connector? Well, I mean, you can get a. You can get adapters, yes. Yeah, because, you know, I'd be interested in getting something that would uh, use it in a classroom to run presentations that has a better uh, ability to uh, run videos. And, and this can certainly run very good videos. And this, and this says has uh, can run PowerPoint uh, 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 on this. this is, oh, yes. Yes. Yeah. This is the RT, it, the RT. and it has PowerPoint. Yeah. yeah. It comes free. Yep. And so it's a nice little cheapy. Oh, for me it was free. Yeah, how that? <laughs> I don't know how much it ends up. You probably get one. I get one of these. But I did finally yesterday. I was running some backup, and I've got a program that runs as many streams as I want for a backup to back me up to the ground. Cloud, and I had ten streams running, and I finally turned the fan on. <laughs> I got the fan going. <laughs> and my wife asked me, what's that noise? The fan's on. <laughs> and finally got it running that hard that, yeah, I needed to turn the fan on. Ten, ten streams of, of what? What were you? Um, outputting to the cloud. To, oh, uh, the cloud. To, oh, I to um, Amazon's Glacier. That I have a program called Fast Glacier. That just pumps. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. Well, yeah, I got to worry about uh, upgrading my uh, desktop to Windows 7 from XP. Yeah, you really got to. Uh, I tend to do that all the time. Yeah. Stay current. Yeah, but I can't do that in the middle of the, middle of the course. It's right. <laughs> it's more disrupt disruptive when it cracks, when it fails. Well, I don't want to have that happen. Yeah. So, so is that the one minute warning now? Yeah, one minute warning. One minute warning. So. Out in the lobby, there's a uh, around the excuse me, there's What's a uh, that? Uh, that one. Really exciting. Uh, well, he had it on the right side. Oh, he had it on. So. He had it off. Yeah. Why did he have it off? Yeah. 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 Oh, and there's some yeah. turned it off, presumably. Yeah, the first two. Yeah, it's like the TV 44. They're all young, they're all attractive. That's a good question. He might have walked off with a clear. Uh oh. That's not good. Yeah. Anybody see what I lost? The last speaker. Did Sam just run after? Where did Sam. Like, oh, there. I thought you were dead. I because otherwise, you know, if I get something that has Okay. I mean, I'll just put it in my pocket. It's fine, but I, it's fine. No, no, I've got it in my pocket, so then. No, no, the, no we didn't lose the topic. Yes. It'll be fine. Yes. No, no. Except the clip. The clip for the. <laughs> the speaker did walk off part of it. 
I was going to uh, look up what this is, and this is actually an output rather than an input, but it's a you know, quarter inch. Yeah. I mean, it's. Uh, oh, that's output. Kind of, this is output. Yeah, I looked, I looked down the instructions. Uh, oh, is that what it, Because that, that would have been well, if it was an input. Yeah. 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 It, either getting this to work through yeah. these guys <laughs> is problematic on here. Any it's, new computer, it's you, need, you need a four conductor one, right? I need, yes, yeah. this is four conductor. Yeah. But you have the attack? No. I have the splitter. The splitter, but Which that's, adds yeah. another layer of confusion. Yeah. <laughs> um, and now it's getting the right combination so that. I so what like you need that. is to get another splitter and, and cut off the other end to, to, to the right. Well, I have. A, I have the female of that. Yeah, right. And um, the and one of these right. that's yeah, wired. Right. Now, if I, I just have to get the wires right, I have to get the wires into the right places at the right time. Should work. Should work. I think I'm, I think I'm going to start uh, as, I, as I have to depart. At some point. Um, so we're going to talk about uh, uh, high cooler rata. Um, these are recycled slides in case there's anyone in the room that hasn't seen the fourth haikus. Uh, basically, so you know, traditional haiku is uh, 17 mora in, in five seven five uh, combos, and uh, I've been experimenting for a while now with a perhaps the fourth haiku where it's a uh, the representation of, a, of an RGB uh, a function over space. Uh, it's kind of like a, uh, a texture shader uh, in uh, some small stanzas that stands as the fourth words uh, in a special dialect uh, vocabulary. Um, and they look something like that. That one actually is not a proper haiku in the sense of the five six five. You get out something like that. Um, but what I'm going to talk about is so, um, uh, as I talked about in the last month before, I uh, suddenly got a flurry of, uh, of interest uh, in, in the uh, from the, uh, the demo scene community, predominantly uh, some folks in Russia um, who uh, have taken an interest in producing uh, a number of haikus and continue to show up you know, daily uh, producing new material on the site. Um, and in the process of, uh, of them showing up, they uh, they gradually uh, let me know that they, they felt that some of my choices in terms of uh, how I'd handled certain primitives uh, left something to be desired. Or more, more critically, uh, what they pointed out is there there are discrepancies between what you would get if you uh, so there's a, you know there's a JavaScript uh, engine that renders static images, and then there's a uh, there's code that converts that to web shader for the animated images, and uh, two don't necessarily over prior to their intervention did not uh, correspond under all circumstances or under all graphics cards. Because where the, uh, the JavaScript implementation is pretty uniform, you get the same result out. The, uh, uh, the WebGL uh, uh, version depends a little on the graphics card, as I'll talk about. So there's these three uh, folks that contact me, and interestingly, in a variety of different ways, and one of them might have to be the sound, the the uh, or actually somehow look me up online and contact me at work and <laughs> um, email me packets. Um, and uh, Stark Star Fellow um, had the uh, rather interesting way of contacting me and posting haikus with comments uh, <laughs> to elicit a reaction. And in a few cases, getting into debates with other folks uh, through, the, through the post of the haikus. So I really do need to add a, uh, a forum. Mechanism to the, uh, to the haiku site. I didn't do that originally because I was concerned about spam, but honestly, it's like well, I'm getting comments in haikus. That's probably a bad, a bad sign that I need a forum. So I'm just going to go through a whole bunch of random 
issues that they raised and then talk about what, what was done. So the first one uh, is relatively straightforward. So uh, square root. Uh, negative square roots, when you talk about real numbers, uh, tend to not be, be a happy thing. You know, if you can put it on flux numbers, obviously you can, you can do something with it. But um, generally, with, uh, with the haiku fourth uh, dialect, everything's operating in, in uh, uh, 64 bit doubles, and is, uh, I don't want to. I don't want to you know, complicate that by uh, assuming we think about complex numbers. Uh, and so this, the trouble is that uh, how JavaScript responds is that you get a uh, number correctly now. Off the top of my head, you, you get out a number for, for negative values. Whereas some graphics cards do interesting things. Some of them return zero. Some of them return. Uh, some of them. Uh, treated as if you've been given a uh, positive number when you've given a negative number. Um, it, it, it's, uh, it, this is what happens when you have a specification and you say undefined behavior. Uh, people do whatever, you know, cost them the least number of gains. Um, and so the suggestion that was made is, well, uh, for uniformity, why don't we just do a, uh, an absolute value before doing the square root? And the interesting thing is a lot of these uh, a lot of these, uh, uh, views, you would think that this would be a, you know, you'd be hitting performance with each, you know, assumption that you make like this. But uh, generally speaking, these implementations are pretty good at knowing about what they do normally. So, in the case where they're already doing an absolute value or the moral equivalent, it's so the performance impact. In fact, that's most of these. They're not all of them. So, the first simple one was, well, let's let's. Uh, for the purposes of uniformity, so you get the same picture on all platforms, do a, oh, cool. Uh, yeah, it's, it's in my pocket. Um, let's do that absolute value. Uh, similar story with log. Um, log, is a, log is a little less uh, clear that this is the right choice, but uh, yet again, you know, the real part of log uh, uh, is symmetric around, around zero. There is that's the imaginary part, but uh, for the purposes of the haikus and again uniformity, uh, it's, it's useful to just take the absolute value beforehand. So they they pushed for that, and I didn't I couldn't think of a strong objection. So um, mod mod. So um, <laughs> mathematicians have a tendency uh, to want to define mod in this way, where there's no magic about zero in terms of the direction that you round. However, uh, the uh, JavaScript definition of mod uh, is far from seeing such uh, goes that way. And that's a pain. So uh, yeah, yet again, going with the definition where you assume you're, you're doing a flooring mod, so that you always round in the same direction uh, is very useful. Otherwise, if you've done something interesting with your mod, and then you cross zero, yeah. Um, and, oh, by the way, then, I, I once leaned on Luke from Alpha to grab these images. So, uh, it introduces some interesting pictures in the basket about what does a mod function look like next Y? That one's kind of oddly chopped up in uh, space. So, this one was an actual bug. Um, so, I'd added uh, and or and not, which are not exactly conventional. Uh, fourth ops, even you know, even on top of the already sort of float based form. Um, and originally, the reason I, I decided to go with logical ops is that w when I first conceived of the haikus, I imagined something like a mask. And so I was thinking, well, you know, you're going to want to say, well, this region, but not this other region. Um, and so I, I did logical and or and um, Except it turns out I didn't actually do logical, uh, logical not, I did uh, logical identity. So it, it was not not. <laughs> and no one noticed because in, up until the day had come along and were examining, you know, I should say these, these, uh, these Russian folks with the haiku, they never pressed they competed over how many bytes long the haiku is. And like they'll spread out, they'll beam all of their, their functions, you know, one letter long just so they can squeeze it down smaller in terms of source size. It's a nice true. Um, so of course they exhaustively explored every every uh, operation of all of them and discovered that not was broken, um, which I had not I had completely missed because prior to them no one had ever used not because it turns out these operations aren't all that useful. 
And one of the reasons that it probably would be good to have a forum um, is because it, it's not clear to me that these operations are, are, are terribly useful in their current form. Um, and so I should probably you know, chat with a you know, set of people involved and say, hey, you know, what if we had some bitwise operations? Because what they have done in the absence of bitwise operations is they have gone ahead and, uh, as, I, as I showed you down the back, whatever, uh, they've gone ahead and actually constructed uh, a bitwise operation out of exponents and uh, mods and uh, <laughs> rather scary expressions just to get back what you could do directly and only you had the operations to do it. And at the time, I, I simply couldn't imagine somebody, you know, they, they produced like sprites, but could not imagine somebody having done that. And so it just completely blew me away that they, and, it, and I imagine that they would be able to do that in far more compact form if they, uh, and probably, uh, right now there's a cap on the number of cycles that you can have in a haiku. And so they, uh, they would, they're blowing a lot of their quota on uh, mods the next few minutes. How do those with bitwise work with the point point numbers? That's a fair question, and that's partially why I think it's a, kind of needs to be an interactive conversation. There is a notion in WebGL of, uh, of uh, you know, there's types and so you can pass between them. So you'd have to, you know, you'd have to downpass. <laughs> For, for uh, there's, a, there's an idiom in um, in JavaScript where if you uh, if you or with if you or with uh, zero you you get the integer part as well. So effectively there's a there's a downcast there as well. So you could produce something numerically consistent. But yes, there's the danger that if you're just doing it straight out, you might not get the same result. Uh, so you would probably for the JavaScript version you would need to say okay I'm going to or with zero and then and or whatever. Um, fortunately, in JavaScript, the precision is fairly well defined, and, and in WebGL as well. You kind of have some sense of the precision. Um, although, um, oh, anyways, yeah, I'll talk. There's some, one other precision issue that comes up here. So this is one of these things where I think I, 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 I want to make a change, but I want to have the conversation with the folks who you know have some idea of how to use it. Because I never even imagined that these would be useful. I, I almost didn't put these in. This was just sort of like, what operations shall I have? And, and oh, I thought maybe you know different reasons. Uh, this one blew me away. So um, turns out that uh, the specification for WebGL is interesting when it comes to sign to sign and tangent. Um, so apparently, what the spec actually says um, is that uh, the uh, they're 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 expectantly well defined um, within some window around zero, um, but they don't, and it's expected to take, you know, a double precision code or whatever, but there's no restriction as to how precise an approximation of a sine and cosine and tangent needs to be. And so on a lot of chips, not all of them, as you get further away from zero, you get a worse and worse <laughs> And so you don't get your uh, you know, sine wave, you get, you know, whatever. Um, and the assumption that's made, uh, sort of implicitly in the spec, is that if you actually wanted to take the sine and cosine of large numbers, you'll mod it with the 2 of 2 pi first. Um, but of course, some do, some do the, the mod with 2 pi automatically, some don't. So for consistency, um, for the web general version, uh, was you have to stick in the mod with 2 pi. Yes? It makes sense to me because uh, some of the kind of things done with the so, cool. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm actually a little surprised I managed to botch this, but you know, in their in their um, careful examination of things, they, they uh, I, I can't remember if they've actually there's a there's a hidden knob to, to let you pick arbitrary size. Uh, so, uh, change the size of the haiku that you get, um, which I shrunk this one down so you put them actually, and then blew up the JPEG, which you know, stretched it, or I don't know why it blurred it that way. Anyhow, um, the, uh, uh, these guys care about every last bit, so only exactly how they look. And so they noticed that when I had uh, ranged over x and y in, uh, in pixel coordinate and then converted that to some floating point. I had a uh, a half a pixel bias uh, 
to rounding down. And so, <laughs> of course, I needed to make sure that I was going from the center of the pixel, which I had been sloppy about. <laughs> because otherwise, if you have, you know, what you think is the function to like, you know, I just bring over the, but if you uh, measure what's the distance from zero, and if you're greater than whatever threshold, then it's black and less than it's red, you don't get a perfect circle, you get something skewed slightly. Of course, you need a perfect circle. Um, well, let's see. Yes. So um, the power oh, function, this was actually uh, was the source of some debate. In fact, there was a little bit of back and forth. You know, I think it should be this way versus this other way. And the issue here, um, if, so if you look at the power function, and um, you've got, uh, you know, for x to the y, if you've got a positive x, um, generally everything is good, right? X is if x is uh, if, y, if if x is positive and then y is more, you get if you get uh, lots of things are floating in the range. And if, if x is below zero, then it uh, then it goes off. Um, but when x is negative, uh, as demonstrated by these wonderful graphs, and uh, this is the real part, the imaginary part, everything looks pretty over here when x is zero. But you get this wonderful chaotic behavior because, of course, the sign is flipping back and forth. Um, and where, where there's some debate around that is that, you know, if you're talking about, say, you know, the negative x that's an integer, there's a kind of a strong expectation that, uh, that you would hope that that would uh, uh, behave as you expect. If you take negative 1 and you raise it to some, uh, some, some integer power, that it's going to oscillate. On the other hand, if you're talking about some arbitrary value for x, that's that gets about it. And the trouble is, uh, the graphics cards in particular are all over the place in terms of what they do with it. Um, there, there are various things that could be done uh, at various computational costs. At the moment, I have something on, on this one uh, because uh, uh, work is a strong component of this one. Um, and mainly just because, although this is kind of an interesting mishmash of, of uh, oscillating state, it's incredibly chaotic. And it's not clear to me that there's much more than the noise that you can get out of that. And there's already other techniques to get to get noise. And so I'm not um, convinced that there's any sort of interesting visual effects that you can that you're losing out on uh, for lack of this. And again, this is one of several ways that you can resolve them. So yet again, an absolute value. Um, but yeah, interesting graphs out of well, from Alpha and I assume Mathematica essentially. So it's like, again, yeah, very pretty uniform over x Negative just goes crazy. Uh, oh, yeah. So then there was the, uh, the matter of the disappearing haiku. So if you had uh, an unfortunate, uh, if you had one of a range of different uh, unfortunate uh, systems, it turns out that you know, every time you have a, uh, a WebGL canvas, uh, you get a WebGL. So you get a, you know, there's an underlying GL context that's actually hitting the graphics card. And uh, each of those, uh, you know, has some sort of resource cost. And in some cases, if you have too many of them, some of them start getting, uh, they're actually getting taken away from the people who are getting out of And you would normally have to then reinitialize them. So a lot of sites, uh, for instance, that shader toy site that I showed you all last time, has a consequence of half the number of, uh, the number of, uh, of things that you want to put on the screen at once. Or some of my preview screens would show you know, quite a few of them. Um, and, and the trouble is that in practice, you know, on some of these systems, you can't get more than about six, uh, six contexts at once. And even with six, you're, you know, that's six maybe across the whole browser, not just your tab. Um, and so uh, what, I, uh, what I did to mitigate this is that I uh, originally I started with a, just a single context, and then I switched to a pool of contexts. Uh, and then I have them uh, render in the background and then flip to a 2D canvas. So the 2D canvas is what you're actually seeing in the front, and it's just there to hold the state. And that way, a large, larger number of 2D canvases can, uh, can be driven by a, a, a smaller set of uh, 3D canvases in the background. And so hopefully, regardless of your platform, if you go to the page, uh, you, should, you should get all of the hard tools on a given page. Which, you know, for instance, you're scrolling through and hitting next to get, go through some of the history of it. Uh, that, that's critical. The, um, uh, uh, and also with the pool, you, you still get some amount of parallelism in the, in the 
coming up. Um, granted, I mean, the Haiku is in general, you know, they're leveraging your, your GPU typically, so you get quite a bit of hit from that. And then there's one other issue, and this one I actually, I'm still in the midst of um, investigating. So I have a built-in, uh, a built-in random function, and um, the, I, if you'll notice, this looks, you know, relatively uniform noise. Here there's some regularity to it, and I'll show you an animated version of this in a moment, and it becomes apparent that whatever I'm doing, so this one up here is a, uh, a duplication in the text of the haiku of exactly the same function as what's down here, yet for some reason this one looks very uniform and this one does not. And so the, they're, I got sort of an inquiry and some, some of the haikus asked me why. And it's not altogether clear to me either. And so this one is one that I'm sort of continuing to investigate. But anyways, let's switch into the... Yeah. I think there's a whole chapter that looks hard. Yeah. Oh, I'm pushing. All right, so oh, that's not going to actually be helpful. Um, so yeah, you kind of see here the the top one has this sort of regularity, but even the bottom one isn't that great. So um, I was going to say they both look regular, but in different ways. In different ways, and it's odd that they're sort of yeah. It's not the same show. You're just having oh. yeah. That is, yeah, that's, that's kind of odd. Yeah. So anyways, I, um, actually, yeah, now that I look at them on this screen, for some reason they look, and that's the thing, the other thing is that I'm sure it's different from this machine than the one I look at before I came here, so now I'm wondering. I'm wondering if it's got this card dependent. Possibly, in fact, one thing is that maybe with some of these operations, I'm, the, the one that's built in is not getting passed in my optimizer, so maybe something is, Something is amiss there, but anyways, that's I, I mentioned that just because that was that's that's one outstanding issue that I still haven't figured out. But anyways, let's go let's go and look at some of the what they've done since last time. And I, unfortunately, I didn't keep the track of the boundary. I should look up the dates. So they've been visibly, you know, dropping in uh, interesting interesting haikus of various sorts. Um, <laughs> and let's see, this one moments ago, I think this because I said something when I That's quite a lot of code tonight, actually. Yeah. Oh yeah, this one's quite wild here. Share that. Play the audio. Play the audio for this one, you said. Watch for the audio there. <laughs> yeah, definitely got some thought into the audio. Um, let's see. Oh, uh, they have these various. It's not this one. Oh, there's some. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, all right. That's good. <laughs> Much. <laughs> Let's see. Oh yeah. So here's some of these uh, the circles and whatnot that came out of uh, that. Why they were concerned about precision of the circles. Yeah. Yeah. You would kill. So. Huh. Let's see. On the next page. Okay. <laughs> oh yes, and so they, yeah, amongst other things, they did the Arecibo message. <laughs> Yes, in fact, you really can do this space even, even without multiple <laughs> operations. It's really, really long. Awesome. Yep, it's all just math. Uh, a bunch of data. <laughs> 
Um, let's see, we've got various friends from one lot. Okay, I'm, I'm a little curious what that would sound like. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, sorry, the one in the upper right. You said, "Oh yeah, this one." That's not too. That's actually not that much code either. It's kind of impressive. Huh. Um, let's see. Oh, this is. Yeah. So they're doing ground pixels apparently. Huh. Uh, dun, 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 dun. Oh yes, they did this vector. They continued the experiment with what they can do in terms of vectors, <laughs> which is again quite impressive given that they had to, you know, do this out of their, you know, their. Doing this as a function of x and y. Um, uh, yes, this one. I was a You're not a proper demo without a troll. Yeah, no, they got to have the. <laughs> this is like one of the standard tropes in the, <laughs> in the demo scene. Uh, let's see. Oh, did they make this? Is their this is their modification of one of mine? They made this mine that was static and made it look like the blue. And again, the, the uh, let's see. Doing soft little chirps. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see. You, you almost have to put a control on where the audio sent. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. These. Well, did they, I forget. It is a drip pan. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's interesting. That had like a 3D effect. Like it actually excludes the. Uh, oh, does it really? Yeah. Oh, wow. Watch, watch the sphere. It actually includes wow. the. Uh, it occlude, yeah. The, the small circle is covered up the. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. 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 All hail the manta ray. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, yeah. Ah, I need to open it in a separate. Room. Of course, this one would be interesting in terms of sound, except the control points are off. Nothing. You'd have to make it the position of the sphere. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Or Need for a need of a refresh. I think I think now that I've got some active users, I need to you know also kind of figure out what they can do. Because yeah. these guys are clever. This, you know, I just missed the raw audio. The guys, these guys. Are you using the uh, audio, the, the arrow keys for anything? No, not currently. Yeah, I can certainly. Hotkey to make the audio visible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And then 
you can just move it around and sample it. So you're listening to it while, mm, while it plays. Right. Or, or you you want that because you got to experiment what sounds best. That's right. You don't yeah. have to have it programmable. Of the equation? Now there's well, a thought. But you, having it interactive would be so much more yeah. yeah. fun. Yeah. You know? yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. But because now you can move it. That's right. Now this one impressed me, but they managed to fit. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> that's a lot of code. That's a lot of code. But still, I mean, again, you know, function of x and y. That's that's no small trick. Uh, let's see. What is the Oh yeah. I don't think they care it's for it. Yes. James, could some of these be displayed on your post screen? This guy's Yeah, these are actually these are more expensive than you'd think, particularly the way that they're being done. They're yeah. being done for every for every every pixel. Yes, the graphics is a you need a whole new engine yeah. just to do the graphics. Yeah. <laughs> I guess this is somebody's. Well, well, do the uh, uh, the uh, the Pac-Man graphics. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Yeah. All right. Oh yeah, this. Jupiter. <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> Life of the inner planet doesn't sound so good, huh? Uh, a real random. What is, what is this? Ooh, they, they don't like my random mouse. Oh, this is, huh. Oh. Yes, of course. Uh, okay. Whoa. What's this? Description is in Russian. Oh, notice it's nicely shaded. That's actually pretty good that it's that too. Um, all right, and then just for grins, we'll. Uh, folks had asked about this one. I still, this one still blows my mind. Yeah, like that's that you could do that in that much code. Oh, not to mention. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. Yeah. No. It's all on the edges. I got to rethink the audio yet again. Yeah. That's been true. Yep, definitely. That's your first question. All right. <laughs> well, I'm going to do a, a quick, uh, quick jump into a completely different topic, uh, just for fun. Uh, this, so this is something else I've been tinkering with, and this is a work in progress. Uh, so this, so that is okay. Yeah. So uh, this is based on a few observations. Um, so elf symbol tables are a lot like a fourth dictionary, was my observation. Elf symbol files are the, the executable format on Linux. Um, and they are used it's both the executable file, but it's also used for, for object files uh, you know, coming out of your compiler and whatnot. And so uh, they, you know, they have a table of, well, here's where this function is. It has this, uh, it has this name, it has this location, it has this type. Um, and uh, as it happens, you can, you can arrange, depending on what you put in the headers of an elf file, for the symbol table to be loaded uh, at runtime. It doesn't have to be something that solely lives on this. Um, and this is a sort of orthogonal observation, which is, you know, most of the important sys calls on Linux don't change around that often. So, you know, using them directly is not so hard. And, uh, and then another one is that, you know, if you do sort of a very naive subroutine threading where you just call, 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 uh, that's pretty easy to disassemble. So, uh, the thing I decided to figure about with was, well, divide the fourth that uses up the off symbol table as its dictionary format. And then you, what you would be able to do if you were change that format in memory is to save and load a program, at least on a set Linux system, simply by writing out memory and, and then running it again. Um, and uh, you're going to do process calls, and I can keep the, the source uh, uh, as, as the code because I can disassemble everything. Um, so here's what an L, L file looks like. You have a header. Tells you where everything else is, uh, and in particular, it tells you where the program header and the section headers are. Um, in my particular uh, files that I'm generating, I generate a single program header. A program header is uh, telling you here's a uh, here's a chunk of, uh, of of stuff that you might want to load uh, or potentially do something else with. Uh, but I have only a single single section, and I want to load the whole thing. Uh, so I load literally just this this chunk of memory. Um, section header is probably one of the different the three subregions of the file are on. These are um, logical versions instead of like uh, the program headers are for uh, you know, loadless region and it needs to be uh, readable but not executable. That kind of thing. Uh, the section headers tell you all well, here's what the code is, here's where the symbol table is, um, and here's what the, so the symbol table format in uh, an elf is actually just a it's fixed size, size. And so it relies on the string table to store the actual uh, the actual strings in the uh, the symbol. So you have you know, here's a symbol that lives at this address, 
is uh, is seen sort of this position in the spring table and and, and is this long. Um, and uh, and there, oh my mind's not cut off. That's interesting. Those arrows would need to be on top of the <laughs> Yeah. Um, so what I wanted to make is practical because the code region here is right up against the spring table. And I want to be able to change things at runtime. So I have an operation I call unfurl, which I uh, it loads like this, but then I want to move the spring table with some table out of the way so that I have room to grow the code area. And strictly at this point, I keep everything still in a valid uh, format in the of and if I know what the actual boundaries are, if I'm about to write things out, I can compact everything back down or copy it to some other region. If I decide later that. Um, but everything stays in half. And you then have room to go to the code, the data stack, the return stack, I'm relying on the OS. So I'm, um, I'm getting the system stack, and then I'm grabbing some of it for the data stack, and then the rest is returned back. Um, and if I have, if I want more on this, you know, uh, that's okay. So, uh, so one good thing about this that's kind of an interesting side effect is that all the elf tools work. So, uh, for instance, I can use objdump. I can take one of these files, you know, use objdump to look at the headers or to disassemble it. And I disassemble it, I actually get symbols that say, here's the beginning of this word, and it's the same, and, uh, and it has, uh, you know, and here's the, here's the similar word. Um, and when there's calls, there it's call and name, right? So everything is named. Uh, GDB works, so I can, you know, have a crash, and his GDB is clever enough uh, that as long as you, um, it's, it, so it has uh, some built-in logic to try to unwind things in the absence of, normally you have what's called unwind info that lets you uh, express this. Here's how you understand what, what my call stack looks like. It has some fallback uh, logic that seems to work with a certain regime thread it's worth. The main thing that it uh, that it needs for some reason is that, uh, so I use uh, I use the uh, I use SPSD for the, uh, uh, for, the return, for the return stack. It really wants EBP to be pointed somewhere kind of in the vicinity or else it gets freaked out. So putting it just at the base of the uh, of where the stack began is going to work pretty well. Um, wait until GDB support for Go um, gets better, because Go also uses ESP alone. Uh, uh, it does not use EDP. So once Go support is... But I mean, are they going to cope with that by... They may just cope with that by... Typically, you cope with that by having online info that specifies... If you're optimized, you can see that can be true as well. So what happens is that you describe in the online info, here's how you... Here's why my base pointer is in the right place. And right. Um, but anyway, how they fix it. Um, hmm. Possibly. Possibly. I'm only in a set. If I'm already going to work some whole. Well, it, maybe. Yeah. So, sections around. Mm hmm. Uh, and interestingly, strip works, right? So you can, oh, I've got one. Of, I want to strip off the headers of my fourth. Well, I just strip the file, and then there goes my, uh, there goes all the names. Um, so how I'm bootstrapping this is, of course, you can't, you know, well, butterflies and whatnot. But you, so I'm just going to start with raw bits. Um, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to want some, some, some actual source code to start my source code for. Um, so I've got a, uh, a template of the layout. Um, I'm using uh, actually using Jazz, but it's surprisingly hard to get uh, the newest number to actually produce an L file where you have described the layout you want. And I have a very particular layout that I want. So this will work. What is that? It's a file? You're thinking of a, a linker script. Yeah. Yeah, a linker script. Yeah, a linker script could do it as well, but linker script hurt my head. So <laughs> this is. <laughs> not, not to mention, I've seen, I've seen like, yeah, linker scripts are. Like, you could do it with a linker script. I have, I use, I use NASM and, uh, and it, because it's able to it's sort of more simple, less fussy. Yeah, right. you can produce a raw binary with NASM. Yeah, it's there. There's similar options, but they're. 
it's very hard, I, in particular if you're laying out the ELF headers by hand, you want to have a lot of sort of self-referential things, and yet you want to, uh, with a GNU assembler, it's not very, it's not very easy to tell it, well, I want to have this origin for this part, but then change it around. Anyways, I was able to get it to work with Asm, and so I started with a, with a template that has sort of, here's the header and some of the setup, and then here's the region where I'm going to stick the fourth code, and then here's where the square table begins and where the single table begins. I have a sort of a, uh, a very Spartan fork that has uh, colon definitions, um, code words, and constant and string constants treated specially. Um, because you need, a, you need a convenient way to do an null terminated string because one place in the, so they, the, uh, the string tables are, are, are null terminated. So. Um, so I made that convenient. So I have all of my sort of definitions in that vocab file. I run it through a script, and I confess I did string processing in Python, and bad. <laughs> Someday I'll write a really good fourth library for doing string processing. <laughs> uh, so I generate a, an intermediate file that's, that's it's just to be expanded out ASM with all of the substitutions made. I run it through ASM, and I get an executable uh, that has these properties. Uh, but what is my status? So I have. Uh, I have all the code words for, for all the cool stuff. Um, I have Perl and Unperl um, in higher level words. Um, and I have some you know, basic uh, sort of test, test of loops and conditions and such. But I don't have the editor, I don't have the assembler yet, I don't have any of the actual interesting bits. So really all I just have is a roundabout way of you know, writing, writing a sub writing But so far it hasn't gotten very big with symbols and everything. It's, it's you know, 5K. And Strip it goes down to 2k ish. Um, not too bad. So I'm optimistic that a little more. You know, it's really, because you're editing, it really is just a question of an editor and a disassembler because you're, you know, if you want to add new definitions in this, in this world, you're just you're looking to lay down some code, some code calls and then give that a name. And one interesting thing about this that I, I feel like it was an interesting sort of uh, realization is it's kind of actually interesting to have a, a dictionary format. That, uh, that is explicitly aware of the extent of, of where the word got laid out. That's kind of, I, I, most typically you're in you know, the front of the chain and this sort of thing. It's interesting to think about it as a region because it has one interesting ramification is that when I have constants, well, I can, one way I can do a constant is I have a, a word that is a code word that you know, sticks the constant on the fact, but it's got a name, and it's, that, that whole thing has an extent. Or if I had some chunk of something in memory, I can give that a name, and it's, its extent is included as part of what the dictionary. Um, I have, that's just sort of random observation, I don't think substance of that, what that does. But, um, so that's where that is, and I'll pull up the, what this looks like, just so we... Um, any questions? So I'm not quite sure where I'm going to go with it, with this. So that that's all it does at the moment, I'm afraid. But the but the cool bit is that you know it's just that big, and uh, and if you do you do disassembly on it, for instance, you get you know here's here's the start, and here's you know I've got <laughs> constants are currently occupying way more space than they should. But you know you get if I go down here's some here's some regular word you know. There's furl, and there's like pull, 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 all these, these stuff words. And, uh, and so the hope is that, well, if I can, you know, if you see furl, and I get all those names, well, then I, you know, got it. Yes? This is what the input looks like for... So, so yeah, so I had so some prior, some prior uh, uh, Linux based course I played with, you know, I, I, I dabbled with like doing DL open to, to open shared libraries. One interesting ramification of this, this approach as it's currently done is that I'm, um, I'm explicitly, so normally when you have a binary that's been built, uh, it, there's a, there's the, there's a LD.SO that is, 
the uh, what's it called the interpreter uh, for 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 even like a normal shared library. Now I have not in my headers currently uh, referenced LDSO. This is a standalone binary. It doesn't even reference LDSO, um, which means that it would be non-trivial to be able to pull in even the plumbing to be able to, to load. But there's no reason I couldn't expand the headers to do it. The one the one reason I guess I, I was specifically thinking about uh, what I could do with various syscalls is because I um, I was also thinking in terms of, well, how much of this is portable, how much of this is system specific. And you can imagine, um, just like we have this Perl and Unfurl, you can imagine mapping this to another executable format like mock or something. Uh, the table was to support the same kind of code. Um, but it's, it's a fair point that I'm basically, without without being able to DL open things, I'm fairly cut off from, there's only so much you can do with raw calls. One option is that I could, you know, build up something external in execit, but that's kind of goofy too. So um, I'll probably have to cross cross that line, but it's it's tricky because then I have to be even more of a real executable. It's, it's actually um, part of how I started on thinking about this is looking at uh, there's some folks online who go through the exercise for various platforms of what's the absolute absolute smallest hello world executable I can produce and uh, and you know how do I you know shit how do I use you know bytes in the headers that are normally just random you know every padding in the header to put code in there and that kind of craziness you know to get the the 64 byte exe that kind of thing um, and, um, and and so unfortunately that kind of influence on me led me to a place where I have the absolute bare bones header uh, needed for an L file part uh, just simply because a fully populated uh, header for an L file that actually references the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the shared loader uh, it immediately you know, grows or you know, you know, that would balloon to 64K you know, immediately if you had it, all that stuff in there at least. Just because there's all, you have to tell it where to go and you have to, it, the, the dynamic loader assert, assumes certain uh, gaps between the regions and you have to, you know. It provides uh, initialization functions too. Right. Um, and um, I right now I have a single uh, one segment that it has code and data and all the headers in it, whereas that will just make the dynamic loader very, very angry. Um, so there are a lot of things that I would not be able to get away with that I might interoperate with the dynamic loader, unfortunately. So I, I admit it is the problem that in terms of being an actually useful, uh, really smart, I will undoubtedly have to cross that line. So yeah, this is this is what that uh, that vocabulary file looks like. So it's you know not too far off from uh, from conventional looking forth. The main thing that I'm, I'm still talking about with is I have some unusual flow control primitives because I really did not want to have to uh, in this kind of an environment you don't want to have to deal with uh, uh, compile time uh, versus uh, versus runtime. And so I have to, uh, I have a word uh, the the. Uh, I have a word that I'm calling times that uh, is uh, take a number off the stack and do the word after you know do the assume that the word after you is a call and do it and do it you know this many times that kind of thing. So there's a lot of assumptions of that I can sort of do straight line reasoning about what's actually uh, present without uh, the, the, uh, where if I were doing a conventional flow flow control I would have to. Then my image of how this would work in a sourceless fashion would, would disappear. And most of the utility here is, you know, to, to be able to imagine changing the, the, the definitions that are in the dictionary at runtime and, and still having the same function and not having to uh, to have a distinction between compile time. And of course, you lose a lot of things not having compile time, so I may come to regret that. But and this, I pulled this off. I was looking for content. Uh, and for, I haven't actually covered this in a while. Surprisingly, it still ran and sort of halfway still made sense. <laughs> so, any any other questions or my my am I utterly off in the weeds here? I know I know there's uh, I know Chuck played the source of magic at some point. I'm not sure what the what the genuine outcome of that was, but yeah. I mean, this is kind of a, this is a bit of a cheat. It's like, well, in a way, you know, if you know, if you have names for the regions, that is sort of, there's, yeah, it's not quite sourceless, but yeah. But I mean, my hope is that vocabulary file as input 
get to the point where the system can self-edit, and there's no way that I can pull my know this is the end of the meeting we'll see you next time and uh, thanks for watching and uh, we apologize for the audio related issues today but hopefully we did a better job and uh, hopefully for next month we'll have our system down pat so we'll see you then Maybe. Well, it'll Jake, be better it'll Jake, be different yeah yeah that's true Jake, Remember, third Saturday so Jason Danish says that the fourth IQ audio was not as good as the rest of the thing. I suspect that's probably because he had the thing in his pocket and it kept muting as oh, he was walking yeah. around. Okay. So that's interesting. But